Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. Um, As you're opening up there, I just want to say thank you all for uh, prioritizing being here this morning. I know on a holiday weekend sometimes it can be hard, but I also want to say uh, I do believe with all my heart that God is glorified uh, by our rest, by our leisure, by our enjoyment of His good creation. And so um, thank you for being here, but at the same time, on the weekends, you're not here, and we're, we're heading into the summer. I think this kind of begins the summer. On the weekends, you're not here. I, I want you to glorify God on your vacation wholeheartedly with no guilt about not necessarily being here at church on that Sunday, okay? Because it's a good thing to get away. I can assure you when I'm on vacation in July, I will be glorifying God on vacation with no guilt whatsoever, uh, and so just know I'm not going to feel bad about it. And so you don't have to either. Okay. So God's glorified in that as well. I, I'll just say some of this is just out of my pet peeve. It drives me crazy when preachers gripe all the time about people enjoying their lives. And, uh, so please enjoy your lives. Please enjoy all that God's given you. And, uh, when you're here, please be here. We love it. We hate, we miss you when you're not here, but when you're there, enjoy it. Enjoy what God's given you. Enjoy the rest. Enjoy his good creation. It's a blessing to be able to enjoy all the good things God's given us. And so uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here um, this weekend. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Um, we're continuing in a, in a series on uh, how our church is shaped ultimately by the gospel. How the gospel is producing distinctives in our church. And this little section of sermons for the next few weeks. We're, we'll be talking about how we live a gospel life. And today we'll be focused on the scriptures. If you have your Bibles open there to Colossians 3 verses 12 through 17, do me a favor, go ahead and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us. Beginning in verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and to be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together to hear your word. And God, we pray indeed that we will be a word-centered church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, I'm sure you've noticed this, but we live in a fast-paced world. We, 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 We also live in a distracted world. We run from thing to thing, and on top of that, we look from thing to thing. Everything around us is sort of designed to hurry us, to distract us. It's one of the reasons why I'm thankful for something like a vacation. It's a, it's a time to sort of unplug. Now, some of you may go on the kind of vacations where you run from thing to thing and you look at from thing to thing, but some of us, especially in the summertime, will go and find somewhere to kind of relax, to unwind, to unplug just a little bit. It, it, but it's almost impossible in the world we live in to have sustained attention on almost anything. It's, it's really hard to do. Everything around us is designed to grab our attention, to get us to stop focusing on something. Every, every time we might find ourselves really, really focused in on something, an ad's going to pop up or something like that, or, or something's going dist- to distract us, the, the phone's going to ding, or it's going to vibrate in our pocket, and then we're going to reach in and realize it's not even there. Has that ever happened to you? You start to panic. Think about this. It's almost impossible, as I've said, to have sustained attention on almost anything. 
And so right in the middle of this passage, as we walk through all these beautiful verses about how we should be living our Christian life, right square in the middle of the passage is a little phrase that hits us right square in the middle of the eyes and kind of thuds down on the floor in front of us. And we look at it and say, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know even where to begin. Do you see what it says? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. A rich, deep inner life is something that is foreign to most modern ears. Most of us can't even begin to think through how we would find ourselves having a rich, deep inner life. Several years ago, I heard about the way our society has changed, and they talked about the fact that even in the pastorate, things have changed. Because forever and ever and ever, pastors would have had a study called the pastor's study. And in recent days, of course, it's begun being called the pastor's office. It's not a place to be. It's not a place to experience. It's not a place to get richer. It's a place for frantic activity, a place to get things done. Now, it's important uh, to do both, right? It's important to do both. And yet, it's important for us as Christians. Essential, in fact, I would say, for us to have a deep, rich inner life that is centered on the Word. I don't think there's anything more important in the frantic, hectic, distracting, fast-paced world that we live in to think through strategies and ways to have the word of Christ dwell in us richly. That's our goal. That's our goal in being a word-centered church is to have word-centered people in our pews. Our goal, my goal every Sunday, some some may wonder, some may be relatively new here, Um, it's rare that we'll do sermon series like what I'm doing right now where there's kind of a different passage each week. I'm still working through a passage, but um, usually we're going through big chunks of the Bible. We just got just got done going through a, a really large chunk of the Bible, First and Second Samuel. We took a break here and there, but some of you might wonder sometimes, like, why, why are we spending so much time going through these books? In fact, I'm kind of drowning in some practical matters here. I wish the pastor would talk about that. We should talk about this, or we should talk about that. Here, here's what I really believe. I really believe that nothing will help you with whatever it is you're going through quite like having the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's certainly important to help you out for tomorrow. And if some of you have a tomorrow issue, listen, you, you, you call me uh, and, and we'll get together this week, okay? This is what I'm here to do. If, you, if you, or you're just curious and wonder what the Bible has to say about this or what the Bible has to be, say about that, it would, be, it would bring me great joy to sit down over a cup of coffee or a meal with you and help you think through what the Bible says about any given issue. But here's the thing, we're not just thinking about tomorrow, we're thinking about a lot of tomorrows ahead. And I can't anticipate every single thing each of you are going to go through, but what I can do is show you what God's Word says through the hopefully the whole counsel of Scripture so that the Word of Christ might dwell in you richly, so that you might have a deep peace, the Bible calls it here. The peace of Christ attends with the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly so that you can handle whatever might come your way. I hope what we're trying to do as a Word-centered church a church that's centered on the Word. Our goal is to help develop, help give you the tools to be people in whom the Word of Christ dwells richly. And so this morning, I just want to show you three simple things about a church centered on the Word. Three simple things from this passage. We're going to focus primarily on the second half of this passage. And I hope these three things will challenge and inspire each of us here to continue to be people centered on the Word and to continue to be a church centered on the word. Here's the first point this morning. First thing I want you to know is this. Churches centered on the word are unified. Churches centered on the word are unified. I don't know about you guys. I don't get the sense, generally speaking, that we live in a unified world. Um, every now and again, I turn on ESPN and I'll watch Sports Center or something like that. I'm interested. Can't watch the Braves on TV anymore, so I have to watch their highlights on Sports Center. And uh, it's kind of a good time to not be able to watch the Braves, by the way, just the last few weeks. But anyway, that's, not, that's beside the point. 
I'll turn on Sports Center and just kind of see what's going on, see the highlights. And then sometimes on accident, you know, if it's Saturday morning or something like that, I'll leave it on for what comes on after Sports Center. And I'm not against watching this kind of thing, but have you noticed how even the people on sports talk shows seem mad at each other? They're, they're talking about who's a better quarterback, and they're yelling at each other, treating each other like idiots, as if it's impossible to think that one NFL quarterback might be better than another NFL quarterback. Is it kind of amazing to think about? I think if they're in the NFL, let's just be honest, they're all good, right? But every, every ounce of dialogue in our culture has been turned up to 11. Everything. The stakes are high on everything. We can't chill out about anything. There is so little unity in the world. And I'm not even talking about politics yet. People are at each other's throats. Now think about this. That's what the Bible says. Verse 14. Paul's just walk, worked through all sorts of beautiful things that we'll talk about in a moment. But right here in the middle of the passage, Paul says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. Now, Paul's just said here, back in verse 13, that we are to bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, we're to forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let it, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You've heard me talk about this, that I think sometimes as Christians and our sort of stripe of evangelical Christianity sometimes gives in a little bit to what I call REM theology. We think that we're just supposed to be shiny, happy people holding hands all the time. And that putting on love and living together in harmony means that we're all around God's big campfire singing Kumbaya 24-7. And I don't know about your life, but my life's not like that, right? I get offended by people sometimes. Y'all ever get offended sometimes? We like to talk like we don't get offended. You know, that's what other people do. But listen, folks, in the world we live in, we're all snowflakes now, okay? And I'm a millennial snowflake. I can say that. We're all, we're all snowflakes now, right? We're all easily offended. And so we sometimes think, my life is not just shiny, happy people holding hands all the time. But that's not what the Bible is telling us to do. It's not what it says love is going to do in a church. Love in a church is going to bind everything together in perfect harmony. Harmony is not, now listen, I'm getting way out of my league here. But harmony is not just one note, it's not just one voice, but it's multiple voices, multiple notes, highs, lows, everything in between working together. And what comes out of it is something even more beautiful. It's greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just beautiful for Christians to get along. That is beautiful. It's not just beautiful for Christians to work in lockstep, for everyone to be rowing in the same direction. That is beautiful. But what love does is it allows us, even when someone has wronged another person, even when someone is causing friction, even when someone is frustrated with someone, even if it comes to the point that somebody needs to forgive somebody, even when there are people who are over here, even when there are people who are over here, even when everyone seems so different, what love does is it binds us all together and what is produced is something that is greater than if everything was perfectly the same. If everything was perfectly homogenous. No, love binds us together in a way that produces something really beautiful. And so Paul says then, from there, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, Indeed, which you are called in one body. That is, this is one of the unifying factors of our church, is that the peace of Christ is ruling in our hearts. And he says, and be thankful. But I want you to notice something about verses 15 and 16. They're almost, they're, they have very similar parallels. They have similar structures. They, they're almost like, like, like twin brothers, right? 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ 
dwell in you richly. Do you see the similarity of these two phrases? I think Paul is intentionally drawing a parallel here. I think he's working outward from some of the ways the gospel produces fruit in our lives, for the way that love is meant to bind us together. And then he talks about if we're going to have this, the peace of Christ is going to need to rule in our hearts because that's part of what's going to hold a church together. You've been called in the peace of Christ to be one body together. And then Paul goes another layer deeper and says, if the peace of Christ is going to rule in your hearts. I think the logical flow here is if the peace of Christ is going to rule in your hearts, if love is going to bind us together in perfect harmony, then the word of Christ is going to dwell in us richly. It's what's required for any of these things to happen. It's at the core, it's at the bottom of what he's trying to accomplish. We must have the word of Christ dwelling in us richly if we're going to achieve any of these things. Here's the reality, here's the point that I'm trying to make. The unity of the church is built around being a word-centered church. If the word of Christ is not dwelling in us richly, we cannot hope to have the peace of Christ in our hearts. If we don't have the peace of Christ in our hearts, it's going to be really hard to be called together as one body. And if we don't have the sense of being called together in one body and the peace of Christ in our hearts, it's going to be really hard for us to put on love, to put on any of the things that Paul is telling the Colossians to put on. All of these marks of righteousness, all these fruits of the Holy Spirit, part of what it takes for us to achieve those things is the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly. We must be a Word-centered church if we're going to be a unified church. It's our standard. It's the heartbeat of what we do as the Scriptures. Here's the second point I want to make. Not only should our unity be built around the truth of Scripture, but second of all, Churches centered on the Word flourish spiritually. They flourish spiritually. Folks, this is a a very old concept. If you go all the way back to Psalm 1, the one we can flourish spiritually. Spiritual flourishing in Psalm 1 is this picture of an oak tree or a tree planted by streams of water and it grows and it's not moved. And when the Word of Christ dwells in us richly. It's like a ballast in our lives. And we need ballast in our lives. You see, our souls are naturally restless. I don't know if you know this. I, you know, pulpits ought not to be confessionals, but I like to share with you some things I struggle with from time to time. Uh, I am not a naturally contented and restful person. It's just not my M.O. I've gotten a little better uh, as I've aged a little, uh, a little better. But I, I um, you know, I'll say on Friday, you know, tomorrow, Saturday, we don't have anything to do. We're going to sit at home all day. We're going to really enjoy the day. It's going to be great. So everybody's geared up for a lazy Saturday. And then at about 10, 13 a.m., I look at Whitney and say, I'm sick of this. What do you want to go do? It's not in my nature. I'll, I'll say this. I, I, I thank God every day for the fact I've been able to be here for nearly 12 years. Because just my very nature would be to try to do lots of different things over time. But by God's grace, he's helped me settle and be contented and thankful and to get to see things happen in one place. There's a flourishing that happens when we start to find rest in our souls. But our souls are naturally restless. Sin has warped us to try to find peace and rest anywhere but in God. And, and without the rich nourishment of the Word, we will never find ourselves still and settled enough to flourish spiritually. And so it takes grace habits that will help the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. It's what Paul tells the Colossians. You see it in chapter 3, verse 16, don't you? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and thankfulness in your heart to God. If we want the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly, we must develop grace habits to get the Word in our hearts, to be shaped and formed by the Word of Christ. Simply put, that's Bible reading, that's study, that's meditation on God's Word. That's hearing the Word preached and taught. Make make no doubt about it, it takes discipline to attend church. It's hard. I was just taking, talking to a precious saint earlier that was telling me about how they had to rework their weekend schedule to make it easier to get to church, laying out their clothes ahead of time, preparing for that. 
It, it takes discipline. It takes work for some of us to get to church. Whitney and I have three children, and we remember when they were little. Well, she does on Sunday mornings. I was here already. But it took discipline to get them all ready, to put them all in the clothes they needed, to get them out the door, to give them something to eat, to get them here to church. It's hard to do sometimes. But having the discipline to hear the Word preached and taught is important. Praying the Word is important. Letting the Scripture saturate our prayer life. Walking in step with the Spirit as we practice obedience to the Word of God with God's help. All these things are important if we want the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. But friends, though there's work on the front end. There's discipline. There's habits that we have to develop on the front end. All of grace. But friends, the benefits are so amazing. Because when the Word of God dwells in us richly, and again, this is the center of this passage in a way that I think kind of, kind of shades the meaning of the whole thing. I, I don't think anything that Paul says back up in verses 12 and 13 is possible without verse 16. So from 12 and 13 and then following verse 16, I, I want you to see all the things that would happen when the Word of Christ dwells in us richly. We become holy. Paul, Paul says, put on then as God's chosen one, Holy and beloved. So we become holy. What, what else do we do? We, we teach and we preach. Look at this in verse 16. Teaching and admonishing one another. We disciple one another. Admonishing in verse 16, I think, is a, a reference not only to the exhortation of preaching, but also to the one-on-one -on -one discipleship, helping others understand and obey the Word of God. We worship we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're thankful. We're thankful people. I, I want you to know, Paul thinks that thankfulness is an essential mark of a Christian. Do you want me to tell you how I know? Because in three verses, he mentions it three times. In, in three verses here, he mentions it three times. And listen, thankfulness is in some pretty high Christian cotton here, right? I mean, it's among some things that we would associate directly with some of the most important hallmarks of the Christian life. Hearing the word, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. But notice what he says. He says, and be thankful. Verse 15. Verse 16, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father through Christ. Do you see this, how important thankfulness is to Paul? I'll, I'll tell you, um, every now and again, I'll look at someone, one, one time Whitney and I were in a coffee shop, it was late at night, or starting to close down, we are on a road trip or something like that, and uh, they finished making our coffee, it was just a totally appropriate amount of time, everything about it was totally appropriate, just the most basic, there was, I was, we weren't put out, there was nothing unique about the situation, and so I took the coffee and I just looked at her and I said, thank you so much, like, this is a blessing to us, we're driving through the night, uh, driving late into the night, and so having this, having this uh, coffee is going to be a blessing to us. And she, the, the girl working there, just like stopped and looked at us like we were crazy and said, thank you for th saying thanks. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, thank you for saying thank you. Nobody ever says thank you. And this was in Alabama, right? I mean, in the heart of the Bible Belt. And I'm thinking, you're telling me that, I mean, this coffee shop was right down the road from the Alabama Baptist State Board of Missions. You know, I mean, th this is absolute 100% our territory. And I thought, I can't envision a universe where a girl at Starbucks never gets told thanks in the Bible Belt. Friends, well, they're just doing their job, you know. Is that a Christian heart? Be thankful. It's so, it's so countercultural. We talk about how worried we are about the world all the time. What are we going to do to reach the world? Folks, I mean, just saying thank you is a really good start, you know? It's a really good start. Go back up to 12 and 13. We become holy. We have compassionate hearts. We become kind, humble, meek, and patient. What do you think if we just took those four characteristics and said, let's take a year? First Baptist Church, Gadsden. And let's be as kind, humble, meek, and patient as we could possibly be for a year. How would that transform our city? I think people would notice, don't you? Now, if I started being kind, meek, humble, and patient, people would really notice then. You know, people like, what's happened to Alexander? I think he got saved. We forgive. Forgiveness is hard. 
It's hard to do. But we forgive when the word of Christ dwells on us richly. Do you see this picture that Paul's painting? It's a picture, undoubtedly, of spiritual flourishing, isn't it? The word of Christ is implanted in our hearts. It dwells in us richly. And that ballast to our soul, that rich inner life, produces these good things. We cannot produce this out of thin air. The the Bible needs rich, good soil to dwell in. It needs time to do its work. We can't just do this off the mat. Have you ever done things like not been kind or been impatient or been ugly to someone, knowing better? And you wonder, why in the world can't I do this? It's because these things can't grow out of thin soil. These things have to grow from somewhere deep. That's why we must be a church centered on the Word. They're unified, they flourish spiritually, and finally, churches centered on the Word exalt God. They, they exalt, they glorify God. Our church mission statement starts like this. First Baptist Church at Gadsden exists to glorify God through But you could really stop at First Baptist Church Gazin exists to glorify God. Technically, we could stop there. We are here. God put us here to exalt God, to glorify God, to point people to the infinite worth of God, to help people see and experience and delight in the grandeur of God. Do you see this? Do you see what Paul says in verse 17? And whatever you do, In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, what you say and what you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. In your work, in your home life, in your schoolwork, that's thankfully on pause right now, in your schoolwork, in your clubs, your organizations and your hobbies and leisure and your travel and vacations and your life at church and your vocation and raising your children and all of the things that you do, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The last thing I want anyone in this room to think is that what happens up here or what happens down there in the office is more important than what happens in your lives. No, everything you do, you do in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm I'm on the commercials and I'm preaching on TV so people see me as the preacher but the primary mode of what God is doing through First Baptist Church of Gadsden is not necessarily through the staff. The primary thing God's doing at First Baptist Church of Gadsden is through you. It's through the congregation. We're here to help equip you to glorify and exalt God. And so when the word of Christ dwells in us richly, it begins to transform our vision of life in such a way that we want everything we do to exalt God. We want everything we do to glorify God. As one theologian said, there's not one square inch of this creation over which Jesus doesn't declare mine. Everything he has, everything that is, is his. Everything was created through him and for him, Paul says earlier in Colossians. Everything. Is for God's glory. Let's live our lives that way. You don't leave here to go out into a secular world. There is no square inch of this earth which is not holy ground, sanctified unto God to be used for His glory. Everything here belongs to Him. Friends, we are a word-centered church. And in all that we do, and all that we try to do, in the scripture we read on Sunday morning, which I think is important, in the prayers that we pray, in what we do on Wednesday nights, in the songs that we choose to sing, in the hymns that we choose, the psalms, the spiritual songs that we sing unto the Lord, but as Paul says elsewhere, that we also sing to one another. In all that we choose to do, our, our goal, our hope, our prayer, is that the Word of Christ will continue to dwell in each one of you richly. Because I think as the Word of Christ dwells in us richly, as it already does and as I believe it will continue to do, it will create some of the most important distinctives we have. Our gospel life, right? What we do in the Word, what we do in prayer, what we do as a church, What we do in discipleship as we live out the gospel in our lives as a congregation, it's going to produce the fruit of a gospel culture in the church and gospel impact outside the church. That's our goal. It's what we're trying to 
accomplish here. Think about the fruit that will be born. Think about a group of people who are patient, who are kind, who are meek, who are thankful, who are loving, who forgive one another. Think about how a group like that is going to impact the world. Think about how a group like that will impact our city, our county, our state, the world. Friends, I don't think there's anything that God can't do with a group of people in whom the word of Christ dwells richly. I believe with all my heart as we continue to grow deep with God through his word that we'll continue to be unified. I thank God every day for the unity of First Baptist Church. It's not something I'll ever take for granted in my life. I think each of us will flourish spiritually. I thank God every day for the way you're growing deeper. I had a conversation just this morning with a saint who's ahead of me in years, who's ahead of me in spirituality, who's ahead of me in spiritual maturity, and she talked about how God's Word being preached has impacted her life and has helped her grow in Jesus. And I said, well, I can retire happy knowing that. Each of us will flourish spiritually. And ultimately, each of us will fulfill our mission by exalting God, by glorifying God in all that we do. On Monday morning, on Wednesday night, on Sunday morning, on Saturday morning, on Tuesday evening at the dinner table. Everywhere we find ourselves, we will be glorifying and exalting God in His glory. Brothers and sisters, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. I want to offer an invitation this morning. Some of you may say, I have never had the Word of God dwell in me at all. I I need Jesus in my heart and life. I need God's peace. All these things you're talking about, I I I try to do them on my own, and it's just sowing the wind and reaping a whirlwind. I, I can't get my hands around killing sin or putting on righteousness. Brother, sister, you, you may just need to know Jesus. I believe with all my heart this morning, if you'll turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus, I I believe you will be saved. If you need someone to talk to about that this morning, I'll be waiting on you right down front. Second of all, you may be a believer. You may say, Pastor, I need to grow in this way. Uh, If you need someone to talk to, you know where I'll be. If you want to use this altar symbolically to pray to God and cry out to God, you can grab a friend who can pray with you. You're welcome to do that. But, but, But make no mistake. Anyone that needs to do business with the Lord, you can do it right where you are. You don't have to come here. God can work right where you are. Finally, you may be looking for a church home. It'd be my joy, it'd be my joy to talk to you this morning about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer is a long place, I want to invite you to come and do business with the Lord. Let's pray together.